Why hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, my name is Dogboat333 and welcome back to Hearts Around 4, the new world of the last days of Europe as the Republic of Comey. Though, for how long we can keep it, that's the real question, isn't it? Now, let's dress for Elvin in the room. We're back to the normal map mod. Um, I think I told a few people that I would go ahead and go to the old map mod and I remembered I was going to do that right when I started recording the first part of this video of the series. And so I couldn't really stop the recording halfway through. So I decided, you know what, I'll go, I'll keep going as long as I can. And I'll go ahead, take a quick break, and continue from here. So, here we are. So let's get back to it. Last video we started back up in a very familiar position. Um, but it's, uh, if you've been if you watched any of my Comey's playthroughs beforehand, probably more more specifically Sarov, this is all probably starting to sound very familiar. But right now we're going ahead and targeting the left wing. We'll focus on some of this stuff. We'll probably get working on the budget and all of this stuff coming up. But right now we have someone reporting for duty, Comrade Oblisnin. The phone call failed. A common occurrence in the Siktiv car are that the deputy w who once dispatched from halls of Kremlin never quite gr gr used to. Pastor Dzidanov made another c attempt. Comrade, this second call ended up ended up sooner than the last one. Dzidanov would rather not make a call in the afternoon when all the few lines available are busy with bureaucrats trying to request papers from their managers. Still, the issue was too important to be postponed, so he dialed again. Comrade up listening. Comrade Zidanov, is that you, my old friend? On the other side of the line, there stood a tired old man who seldom left his dodge these days, yet who, throughout the decades, saw more battles than half the Republic's military. General Oblisnin knew what Zidanov wanted with that call. However, he didn't see himself as fit for action anymore. He had left his... He had led his life like he had led his battalions to the front lines, marching forward with pride and effort only to be torn apart by enemy artillery. No one could be more tired of combat, pain, and glory, but then his eyes caught sight of you, his Order of Lenin at the wall, awarded by Zidanov's hand, and he set his mind remembering. The triumph of the revolution would be the only th thing great enough to justify it. All the fighting would be a vain waste of many lives, including his own, if not redeemed by putting Russia in the hands of your workers. After some more dialectical confabulation, the general gave his caller what he wanted. Comrade Zidanov, my life is at the hands of the party. Nikolai Oblesin took his old uniform out of a closet and got himself properly dressed. If he would be a soldier again, he should make himself feel like one. His first battle would be against the general staff's telephone. General Nikolai Oblesin, presenting himself for duty. I'm ready for any assignment. Any assignment, you say? Comey's great game of politics always ran on a steady diet of rumors. Knowing what one's opponents are doing is critical if, desi if one's desire desires remain in the game. Of course, filtering out signals from noise is a skill all by itself. Tall tales, baseless speculation, and hearsay are common fodder for the various intelligence agencies and it takes time to sift through everything. The latest is a rumor that an influential politician from Gorky has traveled the waste to reach Comey. Depicted as a natural politician, genius and charismatic order by the rumor mill, few agree as to what this arrival means. The most popular conclusion is that too slow for the far left's mastermind is likely behind it. Another communist power player? Perhaps. Hmm. As it turns out, the man from Gorky was not from Gorky at all. Boris. Ponomorayov, as a man's name turned out to be, was born in Shekhovskoya, the small village in what was once Ulyanovsk Oblast, nowadays the KNR-controlled Samar government, had another famous child in the form of Mikhail Suslov. An interesting coincidence, perhaps. If you and call me shaky democracy, would believe this. Whatever his origins are, the charismatic Ponomorov has begun making the rounds. His speeches and ambassador from democratic coalitions and willingness to deal with the far right have been popular through large swaths of the population. This newcomer rides on a wave of discontent. 
and is likely to be one of the prime communist candidates in the next elections. Now, what do you hide? <clears throat> With the dark of night when Grigorenko, the Republican and military's chief of staff, telephones Svetlana Stalin. He had deliberated about the call for some time, worried that she would be disturbed from sleep and thus unreceptive to his imperative. He had not he need not have been. Barely one ring had passed when the call was answered, and the voice all in the Republic knew well answered him decisively. Like himself, Stalina was most active during the nighttime hours, finding them free of distraction and an optimal time to accomplish work. Equally aware of her disdain for wasting time, he got right to the point. Nikolai Oblistin had been appointed to the Republican Republic's general staff, his general staff, and he was most concerned. The man was both qualified and proficient, true, but that was not his worry. Oblistin's past was. It was impossible to overlook his activities under the Bukharin's regime, and thus, his potential ties with the front. Grigorenko was both surprised and harmed by Stalina's immediate agreement. She shared his concerns, particularly those concerning the absolute necessity of preventing communist infiltration of Republican state organs. Oblistin had to be watched closely. They, therefore, quickly came to an agreement of coordination. If only the Republic as a whole could be so decisive as Stalina was, Grigorenko thought, as he replaced the receiver. Keep a close watch. Selena gave, gained some influence, some more Optum support. Um, it's not like Vizdensky has much going. Charismatic new communist candidate from Suslov's old stomping grounds is too much of a coincidence for the Democratic coalition's higher-ups to swallow. Suslov's command of Comey's far left is ambiguous and hard to measure. Perhaps a slippery shadow might have made a pact with a charismatic frontman to enhance his control of the party. The young Republic's policemen would, of course, never stoop to levels so low as to run private investigations on the enemies of the current government, but monitoring the becoming and going of new political figures definitely falls somewhere on the priority list. Better, then, to run some background checks on this new figure. Let's pierce it. I forget if that does anything not or not. I guess we'll find out. Fuck, we'll campaign for, I guess, the center, or the SMR. Decrease their influence, spreading red influence. <clears throat> the detectives were dismayed to find that the end, Ponomayev, was terribly dull. A paper brochure in Soslov's foreign ministry during the West Russian War, Ponomarov fell off the face of the earth during the ensuing collapse and anarchy. Not too surprising as the front's disintegration had seen tons of people claim authority in those first few years of the anarchy. The man reappeared a few years later and the situation had stabilized. Though fragmented communication, and Ponomarov had managed to reach out to his old boss, Suslov. As the man still resided in the front's territories, it seemed that the communists Comey's communists had told him to stay there as a liaison agent with the front's officer clique. A few years later, before Suslov recalled him back home. Upon arrival in Comey's capital, Ponomarov began his political efforts. Outside of his speeches, Ponomarov was a terribly, terminally boring man. Nothing more than a Suslovite automation, it seemed. Automaton, it seemed. Excuse me. The police continued their investigation. Perhaps a few more scraps of dirt could be gathered on him. For matters of state security, of course. Just another puppet. But that increases the influence of the right. Be nice. Ayo. Black market trades increase. Oops. I almost forgot. Let's get working on... Let's do the budget. Why not? The 62 budget of Republic is a critical document providing for a comprehensive list of appropriations for each and every program administered by the government of Comey. However, even the, with the ruling coalition's dominance of a national assembly, its passage is not entirely guaranteed. Historically, compromise has been necessary to pass budgets, as every party within the coalition has different ideas on what should be funded. The budget, thusly, has become an exercise in pork barrel spending, with deputies given appropriations for pet projects to keep them loyal. With the increasing unpopularity of President Vosnensky, however, the National Assembly could possibly be called, not be called by the usual tricks. Numerous advisors and allies of the President have hinted to him that the usual methods of giving the government on his side will be much less effective. Active during this term, and the additional means may be necessary to ensure that the Republic gets what it needs in terms of funding. Very interesting. War in the desert. What a way to treat a former ally.
Valery Mezlok exited the National Assembly and made his way to his car. His car had been provided by the DSNP, considering his status as the deputy of an important string district. He understood that there was plenty of factions who wanted his district, but Valery was no fool. Mezlok had been involved in politics since before the Russian Revolution, and Valery continued with, to win elections despite his advanced age. As he stepped off a curb to cross the street, he felt something hit him in the chest. Someone be nearby began to shout, and his fellow deputies ran for cover. Valery stood there, his confusion dispelled as blood began to stain his coat. He began to lose his balance, and his knees were giving out from behind him. Soldiers shouting, the sun gun file, fire, a sniper on the roof. The color was seeping from the world, and Valery knew that the people rushing to his body were too late. He knew that they would never talk to his wife again. He ignored the chaos surrounding him, finding happiness and thinking of his wife. He smiled as he thought of her face, her warmth, and the darkness overtook him. Mazlock had been shot and killed, the gunmen escaping the scene before they could be identified. Emergency elections would have to be held in Mazlock's former district in order to fill a seat. He was a good man. Hmm. Let's do the Infrastructure Repair Act. While the Republic has a Department of Transportation that handles repairs to infrastructure and replacements to damaged watercraft and transport vehicles, the Department has consistently delivered complaints about how its funding is insufficient to deal with every issue that it currently faces. A new bill has been proposed by the National Assembly for, to pass through a special appropriation for the Department of Transportation, which is to be dedicated specifically to providing aid to their Infrastructure Repair Division. However, certain aspects of the bill are undecided, specifically labor laws and the exact source for the funds which are to be dedicated. These matters must be decided on in the National Assembly before the bill is to pass. The Coming Republic, unlike many of the warlord states that have spread across the old Soviet Union, is blessed with a formal governmental and economic system. How this not entail stability of any sort, of expedience in the National Assembly's budgetary machinations. The so-called Vesnensky, the ruling parties in the ruling, ruling party in the co governing coalition of the Republic, have prepared a budget for the year, a comprehensive initiative focused on external defense, internal policing, and public welfare to repair the damages caused by the bombings. However, internal polling reveals a rather concerning trend within the coalition. With our current number of confirmed votes, it seems that if any more dissent dissensions are to at all to take place within the governing coalition, the budget will fail, and the Republic's government will be paralyzed for months. In the wake of a discovery of a distressing trend within the party, the President of the Republic has been forced to make a decision. The budget could be handed to Kosygin, leader of a young reformist party, and the talented economist, or it could be kept as is and strings pulled to ensure that the votes go our way. While Kosygin is slightly to the right of the President, his influence could ensure that the pa budget passes safely and comfortably, evading an embarrassing government sh failure or shutdown. No alterations will be necessary. We will be fine. We are not fine. Lesnetsky finds himself once again challenged in carrying Comey through yet another year of endless instability. The time, this time the budget is his problem. The parties lack the necessary votes to pass the budget through the National Assembly. On their own, Snusky's budgetary proposals of shifting funds from internal spillings to military production has left the SMR unwilling to back the bill, which they claim to aim abandons the ideas of a true people's revolution to cater to Selena and the opposite parties. The passability are two pros strategies. Either roll back on some of the proposals to get Costin's party back on board, or try to get the Zenops faction of VKPK to vote with the government by promising the military contracts will be awarded to council-run in industries associated with his support base. What should we do? Hmm. We can afford to give the left some support. And it'll give some favors. Hmm. Call in a favor from the left. Or 20, I should say. Zidanov has held, upheld his end of a deal. The budget resolution passed, and President Vazensky saved the Republic yet again. Now we have the unenviable job of upholding our side of a bargain. The weapons order must be placed with KPK affiliated plants. We just have to pray nobody important notices us reshuffling the planning committee. 
Let's just hope the right wingers don't find out. Convenience. I'm sure they won't find out. Oh, wait. The right wingers found out. The Bastion has criticized the government of the National Assembly, accusing it of capitulating to the communists. Representatives have staunchly denied this is untrue, but not many people believe it since Shafarik can point to multiple sources within the government, not to mention the recent addition of several KPK members to the Budgetary Commission. More worryingly, members of the Assembly from our coalition parties have stated that they will vote with Pashinari against the budget should it fail to reassure them that it is not the result of a backroom deal with the communists. We'll have to reassure them, failure of the budget here is not an option. Why is he here? Why are we here? Just to suffer? After many intense hours of infighting, the more moderate Pashinari and our outing allies have fallen in line and endorsed the budget. Through some clever coordination, Zanob's allies and the committee made it apparent here as if they were vigorously defending a social security provision in the budget, then playfully offended and withdrawing once Mstensky drought doubtfully withdrew it. The right wingers are now confident that they defeat the communist collusion with the DSNP, not realizing the actual backroom deal regarding which factories get the production contracts. A few choice cuts to non-essential services like library funding and housing acquisitions brought them on board with a new budget. With the support of both the communists and the right, it won't matter if some SMR representatives won't back the bill over internal spending cuts. This is all we can do. Yuri shoved his hands in the pocket of his coat, a vain attempt to keep them warm as he trudged through the downpour. Almost reflexively, his hand curled around the grip of a gun that always sat in his right hand pocket. He always carried at least two weapons on him, a knife in his boot and the toker of in his pocket. He never knew who might be out of silence in this town. Things are moving faster these days than they had in years. Len was certainly right about that. Sometimes decades happen in the span of weeks. The kid was a goddamn savant at the political game. Bukharina, he can't correct himself. Just a few short weeks, she'd rapidly moved up in the party and cemented herself as a force to be reckoned with. Someone told Yuri she wouldn't stop rising there. She was like a goddamn force of nature in the party, one that so slow was growing increasingly worried about. And therein lied Yuri's choice. Giving her good word for the general secretary would keep her safe for a while longer, and Yuri had a feeling she'd capitalize on that. Good investment. On the other hand, a part of him said to wait and see. If his feeling about her was right, she'd be able to claw her way to so slow for herself. Let her fight her own battles. Get some more political power. We have a request from Zidanov. Through an incredible upset today, Vizdensky's national budget proposal has passed through the National Assembly, despite receiving plays by Stalina and unanimous support from the his party and the Sovereign Democratic Party for its efforts in improving national security, as well as an unexpected number of votes from the Passionary Action, members of whom cited common sense budget cuts, respectable, responsible fiscal policy, but bills still looked dead on arrival. Kostadin of the young Union of Young Reformers was highly critical of the bill for its cuts to internal spending, particularly on Social Security, and almost two-thirds of the party representatives refused to vote for it. That's when the Communist Party unexpectedly came to the President's rescue, the majority of her representatives voting for the budget it on the grounds of its importance in protecting national industry and securing the revolution. The budget thus passed with a comfortable majority, and President Vosnensky is expected to hold a press conference tonight thanking many of his allies and those opponents who supported the bill. All may not be a bed of roses for President in the future, as Lev Gumlag and Igor Shafarovic have issued a joint press statement that they will conduct a thorough investiga internal investigation of both the members of Shafarik's circle, who backed the bill without checking it for communist infiltration, and of the government's own potential collaboration with the KPK, but DSNP might have trouble getting their collaboration in the future. So inelegant. Hmm. Zinsky enters his office and notices an unmarked letter on his desk. He cautiously opened the lover letter and began to read. Zinsky knew immediately that Zdenov had another man ask him. To my dear friend in Siktivkar. I feel that the city has been corrupted by greed. They need an example, a leader to show them the virtue of charity. I have gone through the trouble of selecting a suitable organization. I feel that in order to make the message hit closer to home, that the donation should be equivalent to 10,000 US dollars. That was a lot of money to simply donate out of the blue. Zidano was clearly getting more ambitious with his demands. I hope you make the right choice. Sincerely, your friend Zidanov. 
a charity that Adolf had selected, was owned by the family with personal class Svetlana Bukharina. If Zelensky accepted the party demand, he might as well have been paying the Communist Party directly. Of course, he wasn't stupid. If he refused, Adolf would surely release his compro compromat on him. He pulled a checkbook out of a drawer in his desk, but paused as he uncapped his pen. Should he do what was best for himself, or should he do what was best for the Republic? Information in the Compronaut was released, but since his career was probably over, with quivering hands, he put a nib to the paper and watched the ink flow. Let's hope this doesn't blow up in our faces. So, only 26 flavors now. <clears throat> Nikosos will have entered the room, placing flowers at the foot of the bed. He grabbed a chair and pulled it up to... Yelisavetka's bed. She still looked like the woman he fell in love with all those years ago. She turned her head to face him, and began to speak. The news. How long do I have left? The doctors say you have a, a few months left. Slov did his best to keep his voice steady as he spoke. It's, it's progressed. They say there's nothing they can do, but... It's, it's alright. We both knew this was bound to happen. Dear, you can't get worked up over this. I know I'm dying. But I, I, I think you need to think about your own people. They need you to be strong. I love you. Yelseveka. I love you too, Mikhail. Treasure what time we have left. I was hoping we get the uh, Tabaritsky uh, Colsagen event. I mean, that, that's a nice event, too, but... <clears throat> Kolstov was returning from work when he noticed a small group of children, no more than 15 or 16 members, making little noises with their mouths and making hand pistols and replicating the kickback that came with such pieces of weaponry. In the midst of a fake battle, he could hear a little boy yelling, I am Daryl Vanger, and I'm gonna kill you all! Die, Daryl Vanger, die! Screamed a response, heartily laughing as he charged with finger guns, banking off wildly. The scene sent a shiver down Kolstov's spine as he heard the German ma fiend's man. The butcher and rapist of innocence. He remembered when he was younger the stories of Joe Wanger was used to terrify him. Now these children were playing with him like they were some sort of villain and not a monster. Kolstov thought he about how his son would react to some, such games. Would he know that Durlwanger of stereotypical evil, where he stole young ch girls so a brave man could save her? Or do he, they know what, what? Or would he know the monster who raped girls and killed children in the crib while they cried for their mothers? Regardless, he'd make sure the assembly knew about the impact of violence in the republic was having on the y young of this nation. A letter will surely solve the issue, because you know politicians read letters. Got the Repair Act. Let's do. The Equal Zoning Act. Redistricting is a concern that has long affected many elements within our republic. More disenfranchised refugees on the peripheries of our cities to the politicians attempting to organize their re-elections. The process is infamously arduous within Comey and Siktivkar specifically, thanks to the bombings and high volume of population transfers, thanks to refugees and our lack of resources to run accurate censuses. This naturally has led to an environment in which more or less any sort of population distribution can be constructed and made to look official without cooking the books too much. Behind the curtain, the president has spoken to several deputies on the redistricting board, giving a few favor to certain politicians to make them unassailable in their districts could make th j be just the incentive they need to throw more of their support behind the government's initiatives. Yeah, okay. As part of our new set of reforms, an increased amount of funding will go towards the restoration of functionality, restoring the functionality of infrastructure damaged by German bombings, particularly paved roads, railroads, and larger bridges. The problem is that if we follow the recommendation of the Democratic Coalition partners and commit to this without compensating for the very likely possibility of going over our very limited budget, we risk running up debt, which is notoriously expensive due to our isolation from internal national credit. Igor Ligachev of the DSNP believes that he's found a solution after receiving assurances from Zidanov that the KPK will vote in support of any increase in income taxes necessary to fund the Infrastructure Repair Act. 
This will, however, be highly unpopular with both the people and with the Democratic Center. Fashionaries, on the other hand, want to ensure the repairs are done within budget by utilizing thousands of prison inmates as unpaid workers. This suggestion would be most popular with people, but the rest of the governing bodies would see as highly inhumane. What should we go with? Easy! Prisoners need exercise anyway. Free infrastructure there. Support the right a bit more. Manifesto of Order Socialism. So Slav leaned forward in his office chair, pushing his glasses forward as he pinched the bridge of his nose. The leaflet of papers on the table before him lay scrambled. The text among them hastily scrawled as if written by a man desperate or mad. Manifesto for Order Socialism. So the first page read. In bright red lettering, neat and organized, a contrast to the rest of the work. A fact that Suslov found somewhat amusing, though he could not quite explain why. When Sarov had presented his theories to him before, Suslov was optimistic. Though Sarov wasn't an arguably a brute, he was a loyal one and wasn't ignorant of Marxism. Though Suslov didn't quite expect the second coming of Lenin, he hoped the ex-NKVD chief would at least demonstrate some knowledge of socialism. Instead, he found horror. Suslov sighed and shuffled through the papers once again, the churning of his gut only intensifying. Nothing about the manifesto was inherently wrong or reactionary, but Sarov's warning, particularly in regard to what he referred to as hereditary reactionaries, suggested something far more sinister than simple theory laid under the surface of a manifesto. So Slov pushed himself away from his desk, stood quickly, hands quivering, and called for a messenger. Bring me comrade Sarov immediately. Research slot available, beautiful. Let's get practical industrial administration. Get working on all this. Little zoning act. I'm trying to think. I mean, this isn't really... I'm going to start reading it, so I might as well. So Rove nervously rubbed the back of his neck, hands nearing nearly coated with a thin sheen of sweat as he stared up at the towering silhouette of Suslov. On the Shadowmaster's desk lay a manifesto. Sarov's manifesto. He swallowed hard, trying in vain to stand fiercely against what he had coming. Comrade Sarov. This theory of yours. Sarov saw an opportunity. Perhaps if he spoke fast enough, he could explain the revelations he'd come to. I... You... Sousa spoke sharply, losing all pretense of neutrality. Again, Sarov felt a dagger in his stomach. These musings of yours, comrade, Sarov. They suggest you are dreadfully misinformed about several things. You've been called here not for punishment, not yet, but so that we may correct this error. If there was anyone else before him, Sarov would have sharply challenged the notion that he wasn't being censured, but as he gazed into the cold eyes, still eyes of Suslov, words seemed to fail. For what seemed like hours, Suslov tore apart Sarov's beloved manifesto, and in the end calmly banned him from spreading it under threat of public expulsion. Another weaker man would take this lying down, but Sarov was not a weak man. He didn't sleep that night or the next, like a weak man would. Instead, he wrote, feverishly, almost maniacally. In the end, it would be worth it. Suslov would see soon just how wrong he was, and he would show them all. Do the Defense of the Republic Act. The Gomer Republican Army is a formidable force in the Russian ways, but it has its own set of problems, namely its small size. Due to our small population and necessary inefficient, necessarily inefficient census system, the Army doesn't get quite as much manpower as it needs from our current conscription policies. Several solutions have been raised in the National Assembly to address this issue and defend Republic from hostile neighbors. While the official lines of a ruling coalition is to increase the conscription period from one to two years, the left's frozen addendum, a loosening of laws that banned certain people from volunteering for military services due to participation in certain political organizations, was a drastic measure could assist the Republic in getting the manpower it needs. The solution, as always, will be decided in the Assembly. Hmm. We have gained a stable enough majority in the National Assembly that we can uh, redraft parliamentary districts in an equitable fashion. Yeah, that sounds good. A very generous description of the Equal Zoning Bill. 
On paper, the bill will ensure fair representation by redrafting districts to be of equivalent geographical area rather than based on population alone, ensuring a better representation for the countryside, which generally leads centrist over the population centers like Sikdiv Kar. Now, of course, it's very possible that some districts may be more equal than others. Should we desire to benefit one of the opposition parties for the purposes of our plans, it could easily be done by adding provision of allowing for smaller districts either in city centers, benefiting the PKPK, the KPK, or the suburban regions and smaller towns, benefiting the Passionari. How should we draft the bill? Let's get in Gumilov's good books. We shouldn't have to do this. Combs in turn to face Turban, his face filled with disgust and self-loathing as they walk down the streets. We don't have a choice, Cosman responded, stopping as a communist campaign truck passed by with adoring children. Unless we want to starve, or worse. That doesn't make it right. Right, wrong, it doesn't matter. It, it should. Well, it doesn't. And shut up, they're just ahead. They stopped de in front of an alleyway, the place of their meeting. Looking down, it, they saw a man inside, entirely colorless, except for the red sickle and hammer band on his right arm. Comzin stepped inside, leaning against the opposite building of the room of the man. You got the money? Cosma nodded, taking out a folded up collection of ruples. The man looked at him, counted him, and pocketed him. <laughs> Don't worry. We don't give a shit about you, Ward, I can't say without getting banned, do? Then, as he was just about to walk away, he turned around, smiling. Just leave the children alone, and you guys are okay in our books. We'll keep that in mind. Good. Have a fine day, comrades. And he walked away, like he did at the end of every month. After payment. At least they're getting protection. We are running very low on political power. We could start looting now. Do we want to do that? Eh. I'll save up to get more favors, to fuck Vosnetsky even harder. Let's do Municipal Pacification Act, Bill. Fair military situation is and said to be getting completely uncontrollable, with a general uptick in overall violence over time. Several politicians of the Assembly, spearheaded by Stalina and Kolsajin, leaders of the Democratic Center, proposed a rather drastic bill, one that has been said to increase police powers within problem areas of the Republic to levels not seen since the days of Bukharin. While many politicians in the National Assembly have railed against the bill, calling it a tyrannical government overreach, in a naked attempt at shutting down political opposition to the current ruling parties, one can also argue the opposition is just a an attempt to prevent these politicians illicit sources of assistance from being persecuted. Whether they like it or not, the bill will come up to vote, and it will all come down to the democratic process. Mm. I mean, that's pretty good for the extra ma recruitable population. Though it hurts our political power even more, and God knows we're not doing well anyway. Let's see. We could whip the center out. The bill will pass, including the KPK provision. Get some more manpower. I should read it right. The Republic has mandated conscription to defend itself, but the opposition is highly critical of a two-year draft system favored by the DSNP and PSD. The current system is held for years, as the SMR, despite being critical of conscription, accepts it as a matter of national security. Now, over an unusual act of cooperation, the Congress have endorsed a bill first introduced by the Passionary, suggesting an alternative four-year conscription standard, albeit with a provision for lower load recruiting standards and ensure a bulkier army. With this alliance and the risk of more conservative PSD members defecting to vote with Passionary, there's a real chance that the two-year model is under direct threat. The Assembly will need to pass a decision on the defense of the Republic bill. Yet passes along with the communist provision. We can train up another guy. 
Which we'll go ahead and do, even though we really... What do we need? We need more support equipment. We just don't have the factories for that right now, though. But we'll get to that in time. One day. Stalina has introduced a municipal pacification bill calling for vastly increased police funding and rights to use force to break up paramilitary movements, particularly ones involved in street violence. It's a blatant broadside against the communists and passionary, but would go a long way in restoring order of streets. However, both the DSNP and the SNR are worried about the public reaction. Killing a bill would make them look weak on crime, but endorsing it would ensure its passage and make them seem to support police brutality and politicize attacks on their opponents. Remains to be seen what they do about the bill. Well, they... Kill the bill in committee. Let's go ahead. Request outsider information. Minority Representation Act. Let's do it. It lies a deeply concerning trend throughout our Republic of Inequality in the National Assembly. The majority of the deputies are Russian, with an extreme minority of the National Assembly made up of people that the Republic bears the name of, the Comey. The pro's bill, spearheaded by Svetlana Stalina's PSD, makes a stand for a certain quota of minority representation, with new districts drawn to ensure more minorities are sent to the National Assembly, the rich cultures of the Comey can be protected from the lack of representation. Unusually, Stalina on the left of a line on this matter, with a large contingent of Vznetsky, the PSD, and the commit communists supporting the measure. The fate of the bill seems to rest on the groups that can be rallied to support or oppose it. A more moderate bill could be could gain the support of a mo more of a center, who are connected, concerned about the political ramifications of mandated representation and marginalized the left. All right. I'm gonna need more water. And I'm almost, I'm almost done with this part anyway, so I won't worry too much about that. We could raid St. George. Do we want to do that? Yeah. Vosnensky mm. looked down over the document with a stone-cold expression. Next to him was Grigorenko, his chief of general staff, and L Ligachev, his security minister. All three of them were discussing the documents that had been sent in so far, with only two left to go over. Already orders had been sent to the police around the Republic to prepare for seizure and secure of communist assets. Inappropriate arrests had been carried out in secret. The spoils of these documents had always almost been fully reaped. It seemed that almost all was finished in action. <clears throat> Comrade Ligachev, Grigorenko. These two documents and we're finished. Let's see what else is in the pile. The second and last document was unearthed from the stack of papers. A long-term operation plan ordered and carried out by Yuri Andropov, one of Suslov's lieutenants. After a coup of a democratic government, the operation states that the Communist Party would expand its territory to other warlord states nearby, eventually taking over much of the old Union. The three men glanced at each other before reading the next document, a conversation between Arvind Elshe, a key figure on the left, and Suslov. After reading the document, which seemed more like Suslov giving orders to his inferior, the three men discussed it. Following the discussion, they agreed to gather the briefcase and guard in a secure place where none could see the machinations inside. A treasure worth any price. So Vznensky gets some popularity, Zidanov gets some popularity, and Suslov loses general support. Oh. Don't, don't spoil the surprise. <clears throat> Korolkov's slowly paced down the Solosa docks, the defense minister Ligachev and six Republican guards in tow. The waters, the Republic, which the waters of the Republic, which nourished Siktivkar and Kotlas, and formed the Republic's border with the front, were calm, clear, and placid in the air. The object of Korolkov's attention, however, was no placid vessel. It was a gunboat, the first that the docks of Siktivkar had purpose built. Mounted machine guns ringed her hull, and a single 85mm cannon grazed her front deck, taking up the majority of the available space. To be a simple military man, she was beautiful. A beautiful solution to the ugly problem of piracy and smuggling. Give the dock workers my congratulations, began Korolkov, surveying the radio antenna on her stout command center. They've been paid double for laying her down. We'll be getting you another four. Providing funding holds up, two more for the Soloska, and two for the Vyatka. The newly promoted commanding officer of the Comey Republican Navy started 
stared intently in the waters. Yes, Vesta would do nicely. All he had all his lobbying and harassing the defense minister had finally managed to procure a solution, and it was damn well going to show what River Supremacy could do for the Republic. It's an honor, Minister. So we get some naval commanders. Very cute. We finished up, let's observe leftist paramilitaries. In our nation marching paramilitaries going down the streets may as well be a way of greeting each other. The paramilitaries have a lifeblood, an invisible hand of every party, including ours, and every plotter with a bit of sense knows it. Because of our status and importance of our paramilitary thugs in our public, simply watching what their thugs do and say will grant us access to valuable information regarding their plans. Through agents and citizens' observations, we can figure out when and where the enemy is, from hour to hour. Mm -hmm. I'm already looking at what we might want to do. Sad fact of life, and a republic centered on the Comey region, the actual Comey people and the other finno Iraq minorities in the republic are woefully underrepresented in the co regional government and the National Assembly. As such, the Communist Party has introduced a bill enshrining the rights of natives to have a number of assembly seats proportional to their population in the republic, as well as a guaranteed right to jobs in the government of majority native municipalities. Needless to say, the passing of the bill would strengthen communi communism considerably. As we are already doing well among the natives, and this bill would enshrine them as a party of native rights. As such, passionaries want the bill voted down on the grounds of mandatory native representation being undemocratic in a system preaching one man, one vote. Of course, in reality, their chief concern is the threat of a strengthened communist party could present. As a compromise, the native Comey SMR representative Morozov has drafted a bill that would guarantee the natives access to local government, and a heavier vote weight in the assembly elections, but no mandatory lower limit on native representation. Venture center of rally around this proposal, though many in the SMR and DSNP are clearly more sympathetic to the communists', communists mandated minority representation bill. This is patently discriminatory against Russians. Get that shit out of here. That was the right influence. Not bad. Not bad. Tabaretsky has no influence. It was a quiet night on the streets of Siktikvar. It was nights like these that Dmitry Panin could allow himself to relax. Life in the anarchy was one of struggle and heartbreak, of constant war and stress. The once proud people of Russia had been bent to their breaking point. Still, the indomitable Russian spirit could still be seen and felt by those who knew to look. As he looked out at the people of Siktikvar from his place outside the democratic offices, he could see that spirit around him. Many Russia had found causes to rally around. Some of these causes had proven themselves to be righteous, but others were of darker nature. The wretched Aryan Brotherhood was the or example of evil in West Russia. It had been evil because it had been because of this evil that he joined the Order of St. George. He did not regret his time in the Order. He had been able to help many of the downtrodden Russia, the faithful that suffered under the eyes of bandits and marauders. But as time went on, he began to see the faults of his order. More than that, he saw the fault of her leader. Grandmaster Antipin was a good man, he knew that. But the anarchy bred hard men, even out of good men. Before he left, the Grandmaster grew even more wrathful. The order itself was beginning to be molded by that wrath, and in the end, he could not stand it anymore. He found a new purpose to protect the people of the Republic. It was a difficult road he had opted to go down. The political violence of the Republic was an unfortunate, dangerous fact of life, excuse me. But he was prepared for what may come. A moment to reflect. Advanced computing machines, vacuum cube uh, computing, U.S. versus Guyana. Letter arrived in the early hours of morning, a time which Suslov would much rather preferred to spend asleep with his wife. Thus, when the courier had nervously knocked on the door and quickly handed him the paper, Suslov had steeled himself to read the contents, and yet nothing could have prepared him for the horrors within. Suslov had gotten quite mad. That was the only explanation Suslov could believe. No traces of blank white paper remained on the letter he held, only the erratic ravings of a man scorned. 
the manifesto of order social and flirt provisionism, this new monstrosity was practically wed to reaction. He read with horror at first as Thoreau detailed the valuable lessons to be learned from the thus far superior ideology of the Germans. Now the Communist Party would do well to adapt the tactics of victory, which, as far as Thoreau seemed to concern, referred mostly to the extermination of hereditary reactionaries, state-sponsored corporations, and a promotion of German racial theory. Soft nearly slammed the paper onto his desk, hands quivering, not with horror, but now with rage at his visions of German tanks and camps flashed throughout his mind. A snark snarled through across his lips as he pushed himself to his feet. Sorov had gone too far. This was not the question of an uneducated socialist, but the deranged lunacy of a fascist. Sorov, Sorov barely noticed his surroundings as he stormed through his office and punched a number into the telephone. A cancer had infected his party. He now knew, and he wouldn't see it excised at any cost. The dragon reveals itself. Alright, I think with that, I'm going to cut it here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you as always for watching. If you like this video, leave a like. If not, feel free to dislike. If you want to see more of this content in the future, hit the sub button for more uploads every weekday, as well as occasionally Saturdays. If you have any comments, feedback, concern, any, anything of the sort, leave them in the comment section below. I read the comments to get all of them. I appreciate any feedback you might have for me. If you want to chat, play games, anything, anything of the sort, check out my Discord down below if you want to send a few bucks more, I have a Patreon. If you want to see me do this sort of live, I have a Twitch. All of which are down in the description box below. That's really it for now, ladies and gentlemen. My name has been Dogbot333. Thank you as always for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.